Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. I wanted to take a little turn from the real estate and home buying and just talk a little bit about uh, something which also impacts your financial world, and that's uh, degrees after pharmacy school. And what we usually see is somebody getting a master's degree, although you'll see someone maybe going on to a PhD or MD. That's certainly not the the general case. Generally, we see master's degrees, and uh, there are many, many master's degrees out there. Uh, Right now, graduate schools are profit centers for most colleges. And what I mean by that is when you go to a graduate program, uh, it's completely the opposite of what you would expect from undergrad. So where if you're going to like Duke University as an undergrad student, you know, you'd be lucky if you get a call back, uh, if you, you know, send them a note or something like that. But you fill out one of their forms and I guarantee you will get email and call and all kinds of things to recruit you uh, to be in that class. So it's very easy now to to buy your way into a top tier school. Uh, you still have to have good grades. You still have to have some credentials. But if you made it through pharmacy school, uh, I fully expect that you can do that. And so now for around sixty to eighty thousand uh, dollars it's relatively easy to get a master's degree from a top school. But what I want to talk about today are ways that you can do it for free or certainly at a cost that's significantly lower than that. I'll talk about uh, three different things. Uh, one, uh, how I got my master's degree and how it's net free. That means that I worked and I got free tuition for a couple of years, ended up changing majors, but it didn't end up actually costing me uh, anything out of pocket because I was being paid during that master's degree. Uh, The second one, I'll talk about the free degrees. A number of schools have offered uh, free degrees, and I I don't know if they're still on for some of the years, but uh, I'll definitely talk to you about those. And then we'll talk about the top tier schools. Uh, and with the MPH program, because it seems like it's either a master's degree in something, and there's many different ones of those, or it's an MBA, or it's an MPH. So let's start with uh, an interview that I did, episode 102 of the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast, where I talked to Devlin Smith, and she graduated from UT College of Pharmacy. She did PGY1, PGY2 uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. But with that, she got a master's degree in health systems pharmacy administration. And that's so important because when you look at rubrics for hiring, a lot of times there's going to be some kind of requirement that the person have a graduate degree in administration or something like that. And I think what this PGY1, PGY2 program did is they recognized that although they've got a high quality PGY1, PGY2 a lot of times that rubric needs that checkbox and you need that checkbox to get a master's. So is that free? Yeah, I mean, it would. you're getting paid as a PGY1, PGY2, and then you get the master's along with it. But you're, the opportunity cost that maybe you could have done another job uh, that would have paid more than the PGY1, PGY2. But the first option really is, do you want to integrate it with some kind of uh, PGY1, PGY2. And and I know when we were looking at residency, it was an absolute must to tie it to uh, college because I knew that teaching was in my future in some form or another. I didn't know how it would work, but I definitely wanted teaching as a part of it. So Devlin Smith, who graduated from Tennessee, very smart person, great job at Kentucky right now or at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I definitely you know, would reach out to her if you've got questions about administration. Uh, how did I get mine for free? Mine was completely a, a hot mess. What I did was I, I, I originally, you know, I got my farm D, but I had always wanted to be a writer, and I went to uh, Arizona State for writing, Scottsdale Community College. Uh, I did journalism. I did communications. I did screenwriting. I did all kinds of writing, and I knew somewhere in my future I wanted writing. When I got to DMAC, I was allowed to take classes for free. And, you know, there's a, there's, I think it's Occam's Razor that says that given all the opportunities or all the different options, the right option is probably the simplest one. So if I wanted to be a writer, why don't I just get an English major? 
And what I didn't do was go and get a graduate English major right away. I said, all right, well, if I'm going to be an English major, then I should probably take English classes. And this is what I really recommend is that if you're interested in something, go take a community college class, whether online or in person, and see if you really like it. The idea of what the graduate school gives you, a prestigious name, a cohort of people that want what you want, and all that stuff, that's all well and good. And I think that if you're going in a direction that you're truly sure about, that's the way to go. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's just see for a semester if you just like the, the core competencies within that. And so I just started taking English classes that I would have taken if I were to have been a bachelor's English major. I took literature and I was absolutely petrified that I was going to like fail my test because these were all essays. There were no multiple choice at all, a completely different way of thinking. Everything was writing. And what I found was so much value in classes like formal logic, where somebody makes a statement and you're like, that doesn't sound right. And then you listen to it and then you now have the way to say, okay, well, this is why that wasn't quite right. You were right in saying this, but when you said that that leads to this, that wasn't right. And through these undergraduate classes, I eventually said, all right, well, now I'm just X number of you know credits away from a bachelor's degree. So I just went up the road to Iowa State. And I say up the road, it's 25 minutes away. And I got a bachelor's degree in English. And immediately I can hear what you're saying. It's like, what is the return on investment on a bachelor's degree in English? And those of you that know me know that I've written books and things like that. And, and I've certainly made the money back from the money that I've invested in that degree. But I think getting that mindset out of your head, like what is the ROI of blank degree? What job can I get? Rather think, okay, what skills can I get? And here I'm saying, well, I want to be a writer. Well, if you want to be a writer, you have to write. But what you want to read is some of the best writing that's ever been. And if you're reading stuff that's been around for 50, 100, 150 years, hundreds of years, and it's still around, well, that is something that is really amazing to begin with. But secondly, what was it that they did? And you often find that, wow, they they really told a compelling story. Wow, they really hit an emotional nerve. And you start to get an idea of what it is that will last throughout the ages and what is just a, eh, that was nice. I don't remember the name of the title of whatever that blog post was. but And you understand what it is to write and to be a writer if that's something you want to do. So I went and said, okay, well, well what where do I go from here? And I had been reviewing textbooks. So a publisher comes to me and says, hey, you know, you're the instructor in this pharmacy technician program. Would you look at this book and, and kind of tell us what you think? And uh, we'll give you a couple books or we'll give you a reviewer credit, whatever it is. So I started reviewing books. And when somebody sent me a book, I went over and above and I sent, like I not only reviewed it, but I was doing a ton of, of editing work that I, I thought, you know, recommendations that I would make. And it, nothing really came of it right away. But a year or two later, they came back to me and said, hey, do you want to write the book that you reviewed? Uh, the person doesn't want to do it. They're too busy. Uh, do you want to write this book? And so it led to a, a deal to write a major book for a major publisher. And that all came from a bachelor's in English But then I said, you know, I I really would like to, you know, see if writing textbooks and understanding what what makes a good textbook is something I want to do. And I went and I found that if I go up to Iowa State, there's a program in rhetoric and professional communication, which this is a fancy way of saying uh, it's a degree that you basically know how to write really well. And not only write really well, but write in such a way that we're talking about fonts and sizes, the images and graphics, what messages you're sending, what's a good message, what's a bad message, what's a compelling message, and you're really getting into it. Now, I didn't necessarily enjoy the, the research that came with it, and many of the people going through that PhD program are going on to be uh, English professors and uh, head of writing programs, and, and I took a different turn, and I, I just was 
it, it just didn't make sense to me to write a 200 or 250 page work that is research that takes up, you know, so much of your time and then just put it on the web as a dissertation that a few people will read. I just really struggle when I have to write in academic prose. I just really prefer to write in plain English, make things clear for everybody. So when I was in that program, I didn't have any tuition, so four semesters, no tuition. And I also got paid, I want to say like 20 a year for two years. So no tuition, um, plus 40 grand. And I took a turn, and while I was in there, I discovered this other program called Human Computer Interaction. And I remember when I did get my degree, somebody's like, is that really a degree? And Human Computer Interaction is really cognitive psychology uh, in some ways and uh, some other things. And I wish it was called cognitive psychology because people would maybe understand that a lot better. You know, cognitive psychology and computers or something like that. But what I put together with this Basically, the, the English PhD that I moved to this other master's degree is I put together a program where I was able to look at writing and turn it to audio in such a way that it was now engaging. And when I look at you know the, the writing that I did before and the writing that I did after and the way that I presented it, I know that I've really made a, a tremendous leap. So my way of getting, I hate to say for free because I worked, you know, I did work and I graded papers and did all of those things, teaching comp one for two years. But net, if you look at the net, I, I didn't come out of pocket anything. Everything, you know, was paid for with the tuition. And then when I had to pay tuition for human computer interaction, it was just, you know, I want to say a couple of semesters worth. So I probably came out plus 20 grand on that or something like that. And that's probably foreign to you if you've only been in a farm D. You're like, what do you mean you don't pay for school? Well, you'll often hear that pharmacy students are graduate students, and they're not. They're professional students. And you might say that, well, that's just semantics. Professional, graduate, what's the difference? Well, a professional student pays for their degree. If you're an MD, you know, physician to be, pharmacist to be, nurse to be, whatever it is, you pay for it. A graduate student generally has a stipend in addition to waiving tuition. So as, as you teach their students, you're given this kind of pass on the tuition as well as a little money to live on. It's certainly not much. But if you're comparing it to going and paying pharmacy school tuition, it's a complete turnaround. You know, to be making $20,000 with no tuition versus paying you know, thirty or forty thousand, which is about what it is right now, uh, for a private school. So uh, that's how I got my master's for free. So Devlin got hers by doing residency. I got mine by uh, working as a teaching assistant. Uh, and then the next kind of piece are the uh, free MBAs. So I know the University of of or Arizona State did this, and I don't know if they still have it. But in 2015, they said that if you are a full-time MBA student, then your tuition is waived. And I'm not sure if they renewed it, but I think it costs like $20 million a year for them to do that. And the reason they did it, I think, is that their scores were not good, their MBA program was not well-ranked, and by giving it free, all of a sudden you get, obviously, applications from the best students in the country who are willing to move to Tempe, which is amazing. I just bought a house there. I mean, I love Tempe. And they said, I'm going there. And so now it's, I think, the number, it's in the top 30 in the country and then one of the top 10 publics uh, in terms of, you know, their ranking. And they can do that because I think they have an online program that you pay for. So in many ways, these graduate schools are taking online students that are working and paying for it and putting those dollars into students that are going to be there full time. Now, full-time MBA, the, generally the classes, and I don't know if this is true at Arizona State, are like 9 to noon, Monday through Thursday. And then I think you're supposed to do case studies and stuff like that in the afternoons. But I wonder if, as a pharmacist who's working nights, if you could do a full-time MBA while you're working full-time or 32 hours, I, I think it's probably possible. So you could get your master's degree for free during the day. Uh, hopefully, you'd be able to work it out with your fellow students to make it so that you could do the projects that you need to. But I think you could probably keep a full-time job while you're doing that. Uh, 
I know that the University of Florida MBA, the Warrington College of Business, is offering 100% tuition scholarships for those students admitted during 2018-2019 year. Uh, so you can look at that. And of course, the UF MBA is also one of the best in the country. Uh, and in terms of, you know, great places to go to school, those are. Then comes uh, the IMBA from the University of Illinois. And this is uh, through Coursera. Now, it's $22,000 if you do the IMBA, which is still completely reasonable for an MBA. But if you go through Coursera and you click that you just want to audit the class, you can do most of the content and without having to pay anything. It's free. And what I recommend is that you take one class and you audit it and you see if you can stick with it. The number, in terms of like Coursera, I think the numbers were around 10%. So of, you know, these tens of thousands of people are enrolling in these courses, uh, you would have classes of 50, 100,000 people, and only about 10% would actually finish. So my, my thought is, why not take a class with the IMBA, just take one class, whether it's marketing or whatever, and just see if you like it. My thought really with this was, you know, I wonder if if you really committed yourself to the IMBA, the principles of marketing and finance and things like that that they teach you, and then you com you apply those principles to some business that you have at home, side hustle, whatever it is, and then you start making enough money to actually pay for the degree. So we've gone from just, here's a free degree in some way or another, to, all right, well, we'll give you some free classes or we'll give you some free content online. I bet if you're a smart person and entrepreneurial, you could probably use a lot of this content to make enough money that the IMBA would be a net free degree. Now, I don't remember if this degree is something that it says IMBA on uh, the diploma. I'm going to guess that it probably doesn't, but I would have to ask them. Um, but I, I know that they have like 800 students in there and it's really interactive. And the other thing is, is that because you're working with students from other countries, you're working with students that are also online, you really get a community of people that are like you trying to do the same thing, trying to figure out how am I going to get this additional credential, this additional skill, this additional experience while I'm working or while I have uncertain work conditions. So I think that's about 22000 to get the MBA, and it'll take you two or three years, but I think that that's actually a much better pace. I think we're too quick to say, okay, well, let me get another credential. Uh, instead, let me get skills and networking and contacts that can lead me to my next step, whatever that's going to be. Uh, I remember, and I haven't talked to him about it, uh, but... I remember that there's an online master's of science in computer science, and I think Dalton Fabian, who was on Your Financial Pharmacist, who was on uh, Pharmacy Future Leaders, uh, I think he's getting one of these degrees. And I don't know if it's this exact degree, but I think there's an online master of science in computer science from Georgia Tech. Now, I know that most pharmacists are not thinking computer science, but with informatics and things like that, $7,000 for a degree uh, seems to be pretty reasonable. So again, we're kind of going up the ladder in terms of cost. Now, let's talk about some premium degrees that are going to be uh, super expensive. If you want to go to a top MBA school, the Harvards, uh, the Whartons, uh, those things, those are $70,000 a year for two years. And before you even think about that stuff, uh, I recommend reading uh, the book, Your Personal MBA. It's, I think, like... 15 bucks, 20 bucks, or the audio book, you know, you can probably get it for free if you've never been on Amazon. But read that book before you even think about an MBA that you have to pay for, uh, more than $20,000 for, I would say. Because what that book says in the very beginning, basically, is that the ROI, return on investment, on that degree, depending on where you go, depending on increase in salary from where you are, is negative. And I'll let him explain it to you. It's in the first couple chapters, uh, but I definitely, definitely, definitely think that you would want to uh, look at that before you even think about spending more than $20,000 on an MBA. All right, well, let's get to uh, the MPH, which I, I keep seeing over and over again, uh, some very smart people getting uh, their MPHs and kind of talk about uh, which ones are the top ones and and 
how you can kind of think about strategizing which one you want to get. So the first thing is, is that what is an MPH, so a Master of Public Health? And I think I, I've heard that this is like the MBA, not for business people, but for nonprofits. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I don't know enough about it. I know that Brian Fung is in an MBA program, and I'll talk a little bit about his program from my uh, completely ignorant perspective of you know the Hopkins program. But if you look at U.S. News, the one that uh, Brian Fung is in is the number one program in the country. Uh, so it's Hopkins, Harvard, Carolina are tied for second, then Michigan is third. So that Johns Hopkins degree, and I don't know exactly how the scholarships work. Uh, it's a bit muddled when you look at it, but I think if you're paying sticker for the degree, I want to say it's seventy grand all in. Like they just they don't say like it's this much per semester or something like that. They just say it's seventy thousand two hundred forty for eighty eighty credits, and I don't know if that goes up. And it says this weird thing like includes funding from Welch through Welch scholarship. So I don't know if that $70,000 is less or not, but the online part-time format uh, is that much. Now you are probably saying, look, I don't need to drop another 70 grand after I just dropped what I did on pharmacy school. If you want to compare Hopkins grad school tuition, so that's 80 credits. I'm going to guess that's two years. I don't know. Uh, but let's say that's 35000 a year. Undergrad at Hopkins is 50 a year. For four years. So it's $130,000 less to get the graduate degree. So if you're looking for a prestigious you know, alma mater, that's the way to do it, uh, is to do what Brian Fung is doing, saying, all right, well, gosh, you know, I've got a job now that I can pay for this premium degree. Uh, I'm now qualified and I know what I can, uh, I know so much uh, about healthcare. I can apply what they're going to teach me in healthcare, and I think that that's a phenomenal fit that he has. Uh, but uh, just know that you know you're you're when you're getting up to the top tiers like Hopkins, uh, expect to pay you know those kinds of rates, sort of. So that's an expensive private. But when you go to the publics, so and, and I can't tell because. Like when I go to the University of North Carolina, which is ranked number two in the country, and I push tuition and fees, you don't actually get tuition and fees. You get this kind of ad like, hey, it's affordable. Hey, Kiplinger says it's the best value. Hey, it's committed to you. But where are the actual tuition and fees? And you have to click on the UNC Office of Scholarships and Student Aid. And I can't believe that it's that simple. But it says that if you are... In state, it's twelve thousand dollars, and if you are out of state, it's twenty nine thousand dollars a year. Um, I just don't know, and I don't even know if that's per year because it doesn't say. It, it looks like it's per year, but is that per semester or per year? I don't know. Uh, it's just not on there. It's quite confusing. But anyway, uh, it, obviously, if you're in North Carolina and you can go to UNC for your MPH, uh, that would really make a lot of sense. And I don't know if that's. Uh, one of those online programs and so forth, because the online programs tend to be a bit more expensive. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is Michigan. So Michigan is same thing. It's fourteen grand in state, twenty three grand out of state uh, for full time, which is nine credits in grad school. Uh, I don't know if that's per term or if that's per year. Uh, they don't make it clear, or maybe I'm just too dumb to figure it out. But what I wanted to tell you is that it looks like Coursera is setting up with Michigan to have a Master of Public Health. And I, I, I have here that the Master of Public Health degree is expected to launch in 2019, subject to approval by the University of Michigan. Generally, Coursera has an option where you can do part of it for free and kind of test the waters or whatever. So I'm just wondering if this Michigan degree is going to have that audit ability, just like you can with the IMBA at Illinois. Uh, but anyway, I mean, to get an MPH from the number three in the country for free or to get even some classes for free, that would be amazing. Um, anyway, but, uh, you know, kind of to take us home, you know, I'm right around the 25 minute mark right now. As you're looking towards a graduate degree and what I was really looking for when I was looking for a graduate degree was I was looking for community. I wanted people that were like me. 
And there are just not a lot of people that are into writing and that are into writing books. And I found that community at Iowa State. Now, that I didn't fit into the end point where I was would be doing a huge research, you know, thesis and that I would be, you know, teaching. That was a bit disappointing that I, I, you know, it was all on me that I just didn't, I just didn't fit in. And I had to be honest with myself and say, you know, I'm, I want to write textbooks. I want to write in plain prose. I, I don't want to, you know, do research and submit to publications and, and go down the tenure track. I just want to write books. And I just want to help people do uh, do better in their classes. And so I wasn't necessarily a good fit for that, but I was a good fit to finish the uh, completely online Master of Human-Computer Interaction. And I, I'm really, I mean, I do have 18 credits within that degree in English. I'm a little disappointed that I never got an English degree or an English master's degree uh, out of it. I mean, it's in there. I have the skills and I have the knowledge. But that's the kind of mistake I want to keep talking to you about, which is it's not the credential that you get. It's the skills that you've gotten from the people that you've worked with. And if you have a Ph.D. at an Iowa State that's in, you know, rhetoric and human computer interact or human ah, rhetoric and professional communication, you're working with some of the top people in the country. You're in classes of just Gosh, it was like eight to fifteen people. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I just really loved it, and it was disappointing that I didn't, I wouldn't be able to get that PhD, or I wouldn't. Maybe I could have gotten the master's, but it just, I, I just what I was doing in writing textbooks and writing uh, my own, you know, publications, it just didn't work out that way. But I, I found some great professors over in one in vet med and one in cognitive psychology that were willing to help me out, get me you know through the online program in human computer interaction, and and it ended up being great because you know the the core of memorizing pharmacology, which is the kind of keystone book that launched everything, you have to know enough about cognitive psychology, pair it with pharmacology, and pair it with the needs of entry-level students uh, that are, you know, sophomores, juniors, P1s, P2s, uh, that are taking that kind of step past the top 200 and trying to apply it uh, to clinical practice. So anyway, I, I hope this was helpful. I know many of you are looking at graduate degrees and you're saying, gosh, should I be spending more money? I know that your financial pharmacist team is working really hard to make sure that people don't get themselves further in debt and trying to get down there. And my recommendation to you is to take one class. Take one class and something that you're interested in and see if you're interested in taking a second class. Uh, don't commit to an entire uh, two years. Don't commit to an entire uh, program until you're, you've kind of gotten through the phase of, yeah, this is really what I want to do and these are the people that I want to be with. And I think the second part is more important than the first. These are the people I want to be with. And I think in some ways it's a nostalgia thing. You kind of want to go back to pharmacy school where you were all working together in the same, uh, you were all working towards the same goal. And and while during pharmacy school it might have been hard, you after you're done, you kind of go back and gosh, you know, that, that was kind of a cool time. Uh, and maybe you want to go back to it. All right. Well, uh, next time I'll probably talk about townhouses and houses and, and uh, making good financial decisions there. But I hope this was helpful.